Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen, amen. Good morning, Summit. How are you? Man, it's good to be here. It's good to be back. Yeah, a couple of them. Right, good, yeah. Hey, it is so good to be home. It's good to be back. And uh, thank you for letting us uh, get a time away. You know, we left uh, about five weeks ago, and uh, the world fell apart, and we came home. So uh, here we are. And uh, it's been a strange sabbatical, but I don't want to talk to you about that today. Here, here's, here's really where I want to go today. I don't know if you know it or not, but this week is what is called Holy Week. It is the week that, that over 2 billion people are going to celebrate over this next week, probably even more than that with what is going on in the world today when people are staying at home and they're thinking about this, that this week they're going to talk about and celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus. They're going to talk about that last supper and celebrate Good Friday. And then finally, next Sunday, as we gather together around the world, we're going to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I told the elders before I led on sabbatical that when I came home, I was going to teach on this and had no idea the, the implications that it would be today of what we're looking at because we're celebrating life-transforming truths. That this whole week, as it builds up, there's none other week like this week that we're going to be celebrating this week, the breakthroughs, God's love. And one of the things I want to invite you to do is Danielle was talking a while ago about that restlessness in your home, that wandering in your home, of the pacing in your home, that maybe this week that I want to invite you to be a part of a journey on Holy Week. And it's a great week. It's a timely week. What we're experiencing worldwide today and in the U.S., we could not be at a more perfect time to celebrate Holy Week. Today we're gonna to be looking at those last events of the week of Jesus' life. And what's interesting is, is Jesus knew it was his last week. His disciples didn't. His disciples had no idea that this was gonna be the last week. They had grown comfortable with Jesus, even though they had heard him talk about he's gonna go away and he has to so that a comforter can come. And he, was, Jesus was warning them. They, they, they just did not even believe that that would really happen. You see, Jesus knew his disciples and his followers were going to go through some crisis over this week, some desperation, going to be confused. And the disciples and the religious crowd had a completely other expectations for this week. It was confusing as they watched it all unravel. As you know the story, the betrayal, the violence that would ultimately lead to a crisis of faith for them. So deep of a crisis but the disciples, get this, listen to this. It was such a deep crisis that the disciples actually disbelieved. At the end of this week, that the disciples disbelieved. They abandoned the faith. They just couldn't believe any longer. I think where we are today and in our world today and the week that we've come up to, there's a reason why it's important to know all of that because Jesus knew that we would all go through the same kinds of experiences. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you been confused over the last four weeks? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone seen life get a little unpredictable? Yeah, go shopping. <laughs> life would present us with the unknown on a deep level. And he knew that we would cry out to God when we were in trouble. And so many times when we cry out to God, he doesn't do what we want him to do. 
He doesn't necessarily perform the way we want him to be performing or, or maybe better said, we expect that he should do. And there's moments, and I'm sure you felt this over this last few weeks, that God's even seemed distant. And maybe, where is he? You see, when we find ourselves in desperate times where there seems no hope, and Jesus knew, even if this week of Holy Week, over 2,000 years ago, he knew that his disciples were gonna face a crisis moment, and he knew that we would face crisis moments as well, where we're not sure we could believe anymore where some of you are even sitting in your living room, you're listening and you're, you're watching for the very first time. And maybe you've watched over the last couple of weeks and you don't want anybody else to know you're watching because somewhere along the way, you faced a crisis moment where you unbelieved and you walked away because God didn't do what you thought he should do. And so today you're checking it out again. And I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're listening. Don't, don't go away yet because you need to hear this today. And I want to encourage you today that you couldn't be listening to a more perfect moment than this. And that, that over five weeks ago, we started talking about this Holy Week, having no idea that the whole world was going to change. Literally, the whole world was going to change. And today we're in this place and we're talking about Jesus we're looking at Easter in the final week, and I know everybody knows about Easter, but so many of us don't know about the Holy Week, the week before. And wherever you are today, I want to invite you into the story. I want to invite you into the story this week to go on a journey with us. See, my goal today is that so we're all home anyway, and we can't really go anywhere. We can't do a whole lot. I want to invite you into Holy Week. I want to invite you in, and here's what I want to do that for, for you this week. I want to invite you to read the second half of the book of John, beginning in chapter 12, because we're going to jump off in chapter 12 today of Holy Week. And then I want to invite you, take about 30 minutes. Maybe you do it every day. Maybe you do it a couple of times this week. But you enter into Holy Week this week as we get ready. For Easter, The second thing I want to ask you to do this week, my goal is to start you off. And the second thing is, is what Jake talked about a while ago, is that next week that you, over this next week, you would send invitations to people to be a part of our broadcast, to be a part of what we're doing here at Summit Heights as we celebrate, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That maybe you would share our Facebook page. Maybe you would send an invitation. Maybe you would send two or three texts and you would reach out to them to share that. So here's what I want to do today. I want to jump into John chapter 12 this holy week as we talk about this. I want to encourage you. And let me, let me start by saying that the times are changing. Amen? I don't think I've ever seen a time where on some days it feels desperate. Amen? Some days it's confusing. Watch the news. You'll get confused easily. Amen? Some days it feels like we're in crisis mode. So I've been asking this question all week, what is our response? What do we do? What happens when we find ourselves in this place? And so I wanna jump into John chapter 12. And, and you know, I think the only appropriate response for those of us who call ourselves believers is simply this, worship. It's just when we find ourselves in desperate moments and we worship. You see, the book of John was written by a man named John. That's why it's cleverly named John, amen? And so John was an apostle and an eyewitness account of everything that took place in Jesus' journey. And you'll find that John wrote early in his book that he wanted to give an accurate account. And the reason he wanted to give an accurate account is that so people may believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so he began to write all of that down so that people, when they read about the life of Jesus and they looked at Jesus' journey and they looked at all the things that Jesus did, that they would surrender their life to Jesus, that they would give their life to him, that, that they would become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John records his birth, his character, his journey, his teachings, his miracles. I mean, I'm telling you, they're absolutely one of a kind, that Jesus had power over nature, over diseases, over the power of the forces of evil. And then we find where John records one of the most significant accounts in the scripture, this event six days before Passover, 
Six days before Passover celebration, we find where Jesus in John chapter 12 arrives in Bethany. Now, if you don't know anything about that, Bethany is significant because Bethany is the home of Lazarus. Lazarus was the man that Jesus raised from the dead. Now, that's a miracle, amen, power over death. So here's what makes Lazarus unique. Lazarus was a close friend of Jesus and his disciples. In fact, he was a brother to Mary and Martha, and Lazarus got very sick. If you don't know the story, let me remind you. He got very sick, and it was so bad, they sent for Jesus, and Jesus waited and didn't come. And so Mary and Martha were devastated. They were desperate. You feel that tension in the passage here? And here's what happens. Lazarus dies, and they bury him. And he's buried for four days before Jesus shows up. Let me tell you what that means. Lazarus isn't sort of dead. He's very dead. And there's no sort of dead after four days. Can you imagine that? And Jesus does something miraculous. He shows up in this desperate moment. And he stands in front of the tomb. He says, move the stone. And Jesus stands before the tomb. And he calls Lazarus from death to life. And you know what? Lazarus came back to life. It was incredible. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Can you imagine Mary and Martha at this moment? Their brother was gone. And now here he comes walking out of the tomb. I'm telling you, they didn't doubt anymore because they saw it with their own eyes, man. They saw what Jesus did. And yet still some others refused to believe Jesus and who he says he was, but these people saw it. And what we find in John chapter 12 is two responses to this moment. That when Jesus comes in, and John writes about these two people that I want to look at just real quick. And when we look at this, one is Mary and the other is Judas. I know, I know, Judas. Mary and Judas. So we have two responses. Look at John chapter 12, verse 1. It says, six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. And then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, and the house was filled with the fragrance. So get the picture here. Mary takes this 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume. We're going to find later that it was worth a year's wages. Don't miss that. A year's wages. Can you imagine, John, taking your whole salary and pouring it out on Jesus? I mean, that's what she did. She anointed Jesus, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance. And why not? Mary's life had changed. She had seen the power of Jesus, who he is, and experienced his love in a unique way. Jesus brought her brother back from the dead. She was overwhelmed. I can't imagine how you go from that kind of despair of losing someone, and they weren't sort of dead. They were really dead. And Jesus brings them back. Let me tell you something, that'll change you. That'll put a mark on you, amen? A relationship restored. And Mary's response was not casual. It was extravagant. You see, in that day, there wasn't banks to store your money and your riches and that. And so they would, they would store their wealth in their home, their gold, their money, expensive perfume, so they could trade on that. And so they kept it in their home. And so she takes this perfume that's valuable, so valuable, it's an equivalent to a year's salary. And she does what you only do for kings. And she anoints Jesus, expressing that he's the Lord of her life. And that he is everything to her. She doesn't care what people think. As Danielle said, well, ago, it's okay to cry. She was emotional. There were tears. It was extravagant. It was transforming. It was worship. Can you imagine? I mean, really get the picture, the overwhelming, how the whole house was changed by this act of worship. That it changed everything. And here we are today. We'll look at that and go, well, man, I'm going to tell you right now. If I was Mary, I would respond that way too. I mean, I would do that. I would be emotional. I would be grateful. I mean, oh, come on, man. I would be extravagant. I wouldn't worry about other people's response, right? That's how you would all respond, right? Would you? Do you? And then it's contrasted with Judas. Look at verse 4. It says, but Judas Iscariot, 
the disciple who would soon betray him said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should not have been, it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared about the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. So Jesus responded, back off, Scooter. Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Two incredibly different responses. Don't forget Jesus, Judas also loved Lazarus. He also was a friend of Lazarus, that he loved Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And he saw the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. But what was his response? His response was totally different than Mary's. His response was, well, that's real great you did that, Jesus, but what about today? What are you going to do next? What's next, Jesus? I know you did that then, but what are you going to do today? Because we need the money, Jesus. We've got to be prepared, Jesus. You can't do that. That's a wasteful. He was a thief. And we know where his heart leads him. It destroyed him because he's never grateful for what happens today and what God does. He's always worried about tomorrow. And so Jesus says, Judas, you have it wrong, Scooter. It's not the way you respond. And Mary, on the other hand, models for us what our response or should be our response when we understand we are fully loved by God. God hadn't given up. You know, I've thought about my responses this week and this month. And I mean, sometimes I am Mary. And I respond, and I'm so grateful. And I'm so generous with my praise. But I gotta be honest with you, there's sometimes I'm Judas. I'm Judas. And even though God's provided all the way up to this point, there's moments where I'm going, okay, God, that's glad. I'm glad you've done that. But what about today? What about tomorrow? And God, why are they getting that and not us? And why are they spending that? Why are we doing that? And I turn out and I start looking at that and I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm Judas. <laughs> you see, it's not enough just to have a common sense response. It's not adequate just to say, hey, thanks God. What about tomorrow? Now, here's the appropriate response to worship him, to thank him, to be emotional about it. What has he resurrected in your life? Your marriage? Your relationship with your parents? How about your kids or your career? Your wealth? Your health? See, even the things you cannot see that he's working on, that he is resurrecting in our lives right now, let me tell you why God does that. Because God is good all the time, amen? Then get emotional about it. He's worthy of that extravagance. Sometimes when I mow, I listen to worship music. And, and I remember a couple of years ago, I had a riding mower. And I was, I was telling Danielle this just a couple of days ago, that I'll put on worship music and I get so wrapped up in the worship music that sometimes, man, I'm going to raise in my hands. And, and I nearly ran off the curb with my riding mower one time. And, and, and now I've got this push mower and, and I'll, I'll get out there. And sometimes, man, I'll just, I'll get to dancing behind the mower. And I don't care what the dacus is think. I don't care what the Duns are thinking what Brad or the Gaddises, the Moors, or anybody else, man. Because I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you just need to get in the moment of worship and loving him. Just can't help it. You see, in desperate times we worship. In good times we worship. And what is your response, Mary or Judas? You see, we worship. But secondly, let me say this. In confusing times, I know this is going to sound elementary, but listen to me, when we're confused, and I know some of you have been confused over the last few weeks trying to figure this whole thing out, we need to remember who Jesus is. Now, now, now before you leave me, listen to me. Who is Jesus? And I know some of you right now, you're running through all the church answers, but can I remind you of who Jesus said he was? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's who Jesus is. That's what we're celebrating this week. That's what the whole thing that we're about is he is the lamb of God who takes away our sins. Do you know what the history of today is? Do you even know what today is? It's Palm Sunday. 
You know what the history of that is? If you're sitting out there listening today, you go, you know what, I don't know that. I'm so glad because I'm fixing to tell you because the history of Palm Sunday goes back 3,500 years. 3,500 years ago, God's people lived as slaves in Egypt and they cried out to God and God heard their cries and, and, and God sent someone to rescue and God sent a deliverer, the deliverer whose name was Moses. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. Pharaoh goes, nah, I don't think so. And so God says, all right. So he sends them a plague and eventually 10 total is the showdown between Egypt's false gods and, and the one true God. And so he attacks these, all these Egyptian gods, the Nile River water and then health and creation and sun and agriculture. And each time Pharaoh's not faced. Each time Pharaoh goes, in fact, Pharaoh got attached to some of them. I mean, he got attached to the frogs. Remember that? And he's like, nah, you know, keep them around a couple more days. You know, it wasn't phased. And so God says, all right, here's what's going to happen. It's the plague of death. And it's this one that got his attention. It's this one that got his attention. And here's what God said. God says that the firstborn male of every family will die tonight. Now, let me illustrate this for you in your home. To illustrate this, I want you to have the firstborn male in your family stand up in your living room right now. Go ahead, stand up. Dads, if you're a firstborn, stand up. This just became your story. You can imagine the impact of what's going on. And God said, hey, Israel, you can avoid dying. And they went, really? Tell us. And here's what God said in Exodus 12, 3 and 6. He said, announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day, everybody say 10th day. 10th day. 10th day of the month, each family must choose a lamb. So what is lamb selection day? It's the 10th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. Now, the Jewish calendar is based on the moon, and it's why Easter moves around each, every year. And if you want to know more about that and understand it, Google it, okay? So here's what he said. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the what day? 10th day, lamb selection day of the month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for sacrifice, one animal for each household. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of what? The 14th day of the fourth month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter the lamb or the young goat at twilight. Now, one of the things that people mistake about God many times in the Old Testament, that God's a bloodthirsty God. Don't forget, they didn't have bread they can go and buy already slaughtered meals, okay? So they were used to slaughtering their own meals, harvesting their own meals and all of that. And so God said, look, I want you to take this, take the best animal, don't throw your seconds to me, Fine. don't throw one to me that's already about to die, take your best because the death angel's coming tonight and you can avoid this sacrifice with a perfect lamb, young goat, not ready to die, but a perfect one sacrifice. Now get the picture. So you can imagine that on the 10th day, you bring in a house, this pet, this lamb, right? And the kids, the first thing the kids want to do is name the animal, right? Because it's now a pet. And so they name him Puffy, all right? So let's just go with that. And so Puffy is now sleeping with the kids and the kids are playing with Puffy and they're teaching Puffy how to sit and they're telling Puffy to go and fetch and all this stuff is going in. And then on the 14th day, the father takes Puffy outside and the kids are going, Dad, Dad, what are you doing with Puffy? And Dad says, I'm going to kill him. And the kids go, Dad, why would you do that? And Dad says, listen, it's either Puffy or you. Somebody's going to die tonight, and it's not going to be you. And we're going to sacrifice Puffy so that you may live. And so they sacrifice Puffy, they barbecue Puffy, and they eat Puffy. Amen? Not a bad gig on that, okay? And so what they do is they take the blood of Puffy, the lamb, and they put it on the doorpost of their home. And that night when the death angel came through, that night when the death angel came, every doorpost that had the blood on the doorpost, the death angel passed over. That's where we get the name Passover, right? That pass over so that the children of Israel may del be delivered from death. Not only that, they would be freed out of slavery from Egypt and they would be released to go to the promised land. 
Now that's good. And so here's what God said. Every year from that moment on, I'll, every year of the first month of the year, the 10th day of that month, you select a perfect lamb. On the 14th day, you're to sacrifice that lamb to remember that God rescued you from death, that God delivered you from slavery in Egypt, and God released them to go to the promised land. And so God told them every year to celebrate this. Remembering that someday I'm going to be sending the perfect lamb. That one of these days you can look forward to the perfect sacrifice. The lamb of God to rescue us from eternal death. To deliver us from the slavery of sin. So that you and I can enter into the promised life. So for 1,500 years, people celebrate the Passover until the arrival of Jesus. And here we are in John chapter 12. And now you know what Passover means. Now go back to John. And see Jesus entering Jerusalem to celebrate what? Passover. Now watch carefully. John chapter 12, 12 and 13, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. And a large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. And they shouted over and over again, Hosanna, 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 blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail, King Jesus, hail, King of Israel. I mean, this is a huge scene. And so Jesus enters Jerusalem on Sunday. That's why it's called Palm Sunday, right? And guess what day of the month that Palm Sunday was here in John? I'll give you a hint. Passover is going to be this Thursday of this week. So what day did Jesus enter Jerusalem? The 10th day of the month, which is Lamb Selection Day. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? I mean, get this, while every family in Jerusalem is choosing a lamb to celebrate Passover, God is announcing to his people, I've chosen a lamb, and it's Jesus, and this perfect lamb of God is going to rescue you from eternal death. It's going to rescue you and deliver you from sin and release us to live the promised life, now and eternally. Holy cow, that's, that's the gospel, Mike. That's the gospel. We always say the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. That's the gospel, rescued from death, rescued from slavery, and released to live the promised life. That's good news. That's why in John 1, 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. But here's the problem. You ready for this? Everyone had an agenda for Jesus. You go back and look at that Holy Week. Again, I want to ask you to enter into this journey. The disciples lost their mind on Palm Sunday. Can you imagine they're, they're watching all this go on. They're watching these people lay palm branches, declare the king, and they're going, finally, finally, they're getting it. They're getting it. And then they're walking behind Jesus like rock stars. I mean, you can almost hear the music playing behind them, right? Because people are like, You're, can I get your arm? I mean, this was crazy moment. The problem is when Friday came around and opposition grew, And they were calling for his death, and they arrest him and beat him beyond recognition and then slaughter him, and he dies. You know what these disciples did? They scattered. Can you imagine the confusion, the desperation? All had been lost. The world, as they knew it, had changed. The people of Israel saw Jesus, and they wanted him to defeat the Romans. And when he came in on a donkey... And as a week went on, they realized he's not going to defeat the Romans, so they got mad at him and called for his death. Others saw his miracles and his power, and they wanted to co-opt that and use that for their own glory, and Jesus wouldn't let them do that. And the reason we get confused is we're not much different than those people. Because while they had an agenda for Jesus, we get confused because we have an agenda for Jesus as well. And it's different than his. Jesus comes first to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's still his agenda. Do you hear me? That's still his agenda. 
It's not to make us rich. It's not to keep us comfortable. It's not any of it. It's to rescue us from sin, man, and so that we can enter into the promised life. That's his agenda. That's why at the Last Supper, Jesus said, you're gonna forget the most important things in this world. You'll forget and you're gonna need to remember what is most important. And so he reframed this whole idea of Passover into what we now know as communion, as the body and the blood. He says, as often as you eat and drink, do this in remembrance that I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, the reason we need Holy Week is that we forget because we have an agenda for Jesus as well. And we need to be reminded of who he is and what he's about because we forget we're broken, that we are sinful, that we are sick, and we get comfortable and entitled, and we need to remember how much life costs. You see, during this time of confusion and the unknown, what better week for us to celebrate and remember Holy Week to remind us of God's agenda and his plan for us is to rescue us from eternal death, is to deliver us from the slavery of sin and to release us into the promised life both now and forever for he is the Lamb of God. And listen, I'm broken, you're broken. And I need to remember that because when I act like Judas... Instead of Mary, I need to remember what the promised life cost. And it cost everything. It cost the Lamb of God. You see, in desperate times we worship. In confusing times we remember who Jesus is. And let me say this, because some of you truly believe that this is the end of the world. So some of you have asked me, Edward, is this the end of the world? Is Jesus coming back? Well, here's what I'll say to that. Yes, he's coming back. Be ready, okay? Okay. Let me say this, don't get me wrong. I, I know we're in history. And we're at a point that I know the world is changing. And I have no idea what it will look like on the other side. So what do we do? In desperate times we worship. In confusing times we remember who Jesus is. And listen to me, in crisis time, we depend on God. We depend on God's strength. You know, when the disciples saw Jesus arrested and beaten and killed, the disciples just unbelieved. They just couldn't believe anymore. The reason is because crisis has that effect on us so many times. And that's where some of you are today because somewhere along the journey, maybe it's not this crisis, maybe it was another crisis, your mama, your child, your husband, your wife, your extended family, whatever, that God didn't show up the way you thought he should show up. And you're looking for a way out and, and maybe you took that way out back then. Maybe some of you are looking for a way out right now. You've been trying to turn this off the whole time because that's what happens in crisis for some of us. That's why some of you are not even sure you can follow this God anymore. But interestingly enough, you're listening, so don't go anywhere <laughs> because crisis moments define us and crisis moments caused you to start listening for the first time in your life. So don't go anywhere. There's a reason you're listening. There's a reason God's drawing you because he loves you. And no, he didn't do what you thought he needed to do any more than he's done everything I thought he needs to do. Because his agenda is the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, to set us free for the promised life. You see, for the disciples, they were looking for hope. God didn't do what they expected, even though he was clear about what he was doing. All along, he told them, hey, guys, this is what I'm gonna do. And then he still didn't do it, and they still didn't believe. Everything they knew had ended and yet Jesus warned them it would happen. And he even mapped a way for them not to abandon their faith. In John chapter 12, he reminded the disciples of the desperation you're about to feel and the confusion you're about to experience. Understand two things. You ready for this? Number one, be clear, God has a plan. In John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. In other words, to fulfill what God has for me. I'll tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But it's death, he's talking about himself, his death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of what? New lives. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. You see, Daniel said a while ago, 
during this season when Jesus was arrested and beaten and flogged and murdered and all that, God wasn't up there going, how did this happen? I never saw this coming. It was his plan all along. It was his plan all along. He was in the midst of it. And just because you can't see it and just because you can't understand his plan doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan and understands clearly what he's up to. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. Through Jesus, many were going to be saved and are being saved and will be saved. But he had to pay the price for our sin. Why? So that we could be rescued from eternal death so that we could be delivered from the slavery of sin, so that we could be released to enter into the promised life now and forever. Now listen to me, I wanna tread lightly here. I don't believe that five weeks ago, three months ago, four months ago, whenever this thing started, that God was up in heaven going, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Where did this pandemic come from? God's still not up there scrambling. Listen to me. He has a plan. Be clear on this. We can trust him. We belong to him. He has a plan, and it may look different than your plan. In fact, it does. Because the impossible becomes possible through the death and resurrection of Christ. Our hope is not on a government. Our hope is not on mankind. Our hope is on the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. That's our hope. Which brings me to my second point. Trust and follow. Depend on him. John chapter 12, verse 26. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of light. Jesus shouted to the crowds, if you trust me, if you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me, I have come as a light to shine in the dark world so that all of you to put your trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. Did the disciples trust Jesus? No, and neither do we. Because in crisis moments, we tend to lose our way. We hoard, we get stingy, We think everybody else is not taking it as seriously as you. It's called judging. We think it's all about us. (laughs) We focus on our needs, our hopes, our stuff, our savings, our next. Then all of a sudden, when God doesn't obey our plows and our agendas and all of our things, we disbelieve and we get frustrated. We're in that moment. We're a moment in history. Now listen to me. I've said this more than once this week. And I want you to hear me this morning. We're, We're done. We are just as dependent upon God as we were four weeks ago. Nothing has changed. And listen, before you start telling me all the changes in the world, listen to me. We know just as much about the future today as we knew four weeks ago. <laughs> so what's changed? See, we're just as dependent on God today, and we know just as much about the future as we did four weeks ago. But here's the caveat. It's just that today, we are much more aware of that dependence. And so what a beautiful week to enter in to Holy Week, to remind us this in our home, to remind us we have a hope, and his name is Jesus. It's not the government It's not Brooksers having toilet paper, amen? All right. I know, I felt rich the other day. I opened our cabinet, we had five rolls of toilet paper in the whole house, and I was like, yes, got five. I felt rich for a moment, amen? You see, here's the deal. In all moments, we've got to be ready. The problem is four weeks ago, we were just comfortable. We were just comfortable. And we've got to be ready because there are those who are ready to believe And they're watching your response right now. In fact, in John 12, listen to this. But despite all the miraculous signs that Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. Isn't that amazing? After all that Jesus had done, they still didn't believe. And then it says many people did believe in him. However, including some of the Jewish leaders, 
but they wouldn't admit it for fear that the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. This is, this is so crazy, for they loved human praise more than the praise of God. Listen, there's, there's going to be some, no matter how miraculous it is, they're just not going to believe. And some of you, when all this is over, even though right now you're going, I want to believe, I want to believe, I want to believe. When all this is over, some of you, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Because this, this is what's going to happen. Some of you, when it all is over and we're able to gather in these rooms again, all over the world again, some of you are going to do exactly what those guys did. Is you're going to love human praise more than the praise of God and you're going to walk away. And I'm telling you, Jesus is inviting you now. He's inviting you right now. Others are going to believe, and that may be you today, because you finally realize you're broken and you need a Savior. If, if there's ever a time where we realize the world is broken, just look around. We're broken. And that's why Jesus came, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. And you see, that's the gospel today is we depend on the Father. We trust in his deliverance. He has a plan. I don't know what it is, but you know what? I don't have to. I trust him. And I just wonder, would you trust him today? Wherever you're sitting in your living rooms, whatever you're doing, you realize you're broken today, that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. As John said, I'm writing all this down because it's an accurate view. Why? So that you may believe. So I invite you, right where you sit, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, to pray a simple prayer that, God, I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. Forgive me. Save me. and Be the Lord of my life. And if you did that in your living room today, shoot us a message. Shoot us a private message. Shoot us an email, edward at summitheightsfellowship.com, jake at summitheightsfellowship.com, david at summitheightsfellowship.com. Let us know. We would love to celebrate with you and help you take the next steps. See, today's your day. And for, you, for those of you today, I invite you to enter this journey with us. Spend the next seven days as we get ready for Easter Sunday in that last week, that second half of the book of John. And let's journey together this week. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this moment in history. This, this didn't surprise you. God, we live in a world that's broken. We live in a world that is sinful. And so it shouldn't surprise us that things happen. So God, we just say we trust you today. We don't know what tomorrow holds any more than we knew four weeks ago. Today we trust you. And we know you have tomorrow taken care of. And so today we depend and trust on you. And thank you in that moment for all that you've done. May our response be that of worship. And so God, I pray for that one that sits in their living room today. Let's put their trust in you. Give them courage, Lord, to reach out. Maybe their home church, wherever they're listening. But they would reach out. And let somebody know that they have prayed to receive Christ. Give them that courage. And God, for that one that's struggling to disbelieve, God, would you draw them to you? I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it in his name. And everybody said, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you. I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.